Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Christy Cobb. Dr. Cobb is Assistant Professor of Christianity at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. Her research interests include slavery, Luke Acts, gender sexuality, and ancient narratives. She has published numerous scholarly articles, is the co-editor of the volume Sex, Violence, and Early Christian Texts, and is the author of the topic of our discussion this afternoon, Slavery, Gender, Truth, and Power in Luke Acts and Other Ancient Narratives. So Christy, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Before we get to the texts themselves in your book and your methodology, can you give us a little overview of the everyday realities of slavery in the ancient Mediterranean? The everyday reality for enslaved persons really varied according to what estate an enslaved person might have been working on, whether that was small or large, or also what kind of job that they did. So I'll begin with the perhaps more brutal side. So there are a large number of enslaved persons in antiquity that would have been in very difficult jobs, such as working in the mines, for example, where an enslaved person would be forced to work in these really dangerous situations and circumstances. And then if they were also working in a large group, Group. They might have even been chained, um, shackled in the evenings. If they didn't finish the amount of work that was expected of them, they were treated quite inhumanely and brutally punished. They might have been not fed enough, right? Things like this. So on the one hand, an everyday life of an enslaved person could be this really brutal situation where they're doing hard manual labor and living, you know, in chains. On the other hand, some enslaved persons worked inside of a house with a family, especially enslaved women were often responsible for all the cooking, all the cleaning, taking care of children. Any sort of domestic needs were often given to an enslaved person. And so the daily life of that person would have been quite different than one that was forced to, say, be working in a mine. But that doesn't mean that there was any less brutality. Even still, in a domestic sphere, an enslaved person could be punished, could be tortured, could be susceptible to sexual violence. And these were daily fears and daily experiences that an enslaved person had to go through. So the daily life, I think, could be different according to location. But also, we should be aware that an enslaved person's life e daily, even if they were in sort of a safe place, might have been filled with fear or might have been forced to do things that they didn't want to do because of their enslaved status. What were the general attitudes towards slaves? Like Aristotle's concept of natural slaves, for instance. There are lots of other concepts, but if you just kind of give us a rundown of these general attitudes and stereotypes about slaves. So Aristotle certainly is the right person to turn to in thinking about philosophical attitudes towards slaves. What Aristotle said is basically this concept of natural slavery, which means that some people are born to be enslaved and others are born to be free. And that concept really justified in the enslavement of people because when the free and elite viewed it as in, well, this group of people were sort of meant to be enslaved, then it was able to be justified a bit more philosophically and ethically for their treatment of slaves. So in that way, many people would say philosophically, they're not viewing an enslaved person as a human, right? They're viewing the enslaved person as a tool or something that they can use as an object in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, even though that is the ideology that's present in a lot of our texts, we can also see that people didn't often treat enslaved persons in the way that revealed that natural slavery. For example, we have a, quite a lot of texts regulating the treatment of enslaved persons. So a number of people in antiquity would say, well, you, you know, you shouldn't be that brutal to your slaves. And they would caution other enslavers about their treatment. And so you could see that the rules differed sort of in different ways. That said, there was nobody in antiquity who was really arguing for the abolition of slavery. Everyone was sort of invested in the system of slavery. And so working within it, even the philosophical ideology helps them to reconcile this aspect of their daily lives about slavery. 
So you also mentioned stereotypes, and this is another big piece of this. In ancient writing, when someone was viewing an enslaved person, they would often place them into these categories of a good slave and a bad slave. So a good slave would be someone who was constantly doing what was expected of them, obeying and having a really good attitude about their jobs, being very submissive to their enslaver and also even like gracious thank you to their enslaver that was the sort of good slave stereotype and on the other hand the bad slave stereotype everything got put into that such as disobedient enslaved persons or the ones who constantly made mistakes and who were sort of the butt of the joke, let's say, or for women, sexually promiscuous, that was sort of a bad slave stereotype. In literature, we see these really active, like enslaved characters are often just placed into one category and the other. But in reality, we can imagine that these are, again, ideologized versions of enslaved persons where an real human enslaved person wouldn't just always be good or wouldn't just always be bad. And there might be some movement in between their behavior. And of course, we can also imagine that those enslaved persons who might have been perceived in the bad slave stereotype might have been resisting. They might have had these moments of resisting their status and resisting their enslaver in these subtle ways, which is really important to point out. So when we, and you see the good bad slave stereotype in literature, we shouldn't just always assume this was an accurate portrayal, just as we might not assume Aristotle's natural slavery is accurate today. Immediately what came to mind is, along with the stereotypes and along with the philosophical ideas, in your work, you also mentioned drawing on the work of Paige Dubois that there was also a concept that slaves could not tell the truth unless subjected to torture. It fits within this idea that enslaved persons aren't full humans with rational thoughts. And so then a free elite person would not believe that an enslaved person could give accurate information the way a free person might. And so then there were strategies basically under torture for an enslaved person to tell the truth. And then what's interesting is that the literature suggests that every time if an enslaved person is tortured, then that truth was believed under torture. So it was like, if you torture an enslaved person, then you will for sure get the truth right out. And that becomes pretty problematic when you think of the sources, because then are we recognizing that an elite person wrote this and then that they're portraying an enslaved person's words as untruthful because of what they might want for themselves when you're sort of trying to read between the lines, right? And then also... It's unclear in practice how often this torture happened. It's in enough of our sources that we recognize that it was occurring, but it's not certain how often this was a reality, that enslaved persons might be brought into a trial and then tortured in order to give evidence. Yes, it's definitely in pretty much all the Greco-Roman novels. So like it every text without exception, like there's always a trial scene. Inevitably, somebody's like, we need to bring that slave in here so we can torture them to get the truth. And similarly, in the early Christian novels, which I think mimic the Greco-Roman ones, these are called the apocryphal acts. We see some of that as well, where enslaved persons are tortured in order to get the truth about what happens. And so you're right, the literature, which we read as fiction, but it's relaying something about enslaved persons in antiquity. In my previous discussion with Celine Lilly, we talked about how there are not only written texts, but there are visual texts. I really admire scholars such as Brigida Call and Davina Lopez, who use these monuments in conveying their methodologies. Your work really intersects a lot with archaeological evidence, funerary monuments and art. The funerary monuments I found also speak to this. You were talking about how there was an idealized version of how you should treat slaves, but the realities were often ambiguous in terms of how masters interacted with their servants. I don't know if you could just talk about how slaves are depicted in the ancient Mediterranean funerary monuments. For instance, what is symbolic sizing? 
I'll also back up a little and tell you how I stumbled upon the funerary monuments. I was in my graduate program at Drew University, and we went on a trip with students and a professor to Turkey. And while we were on that trip, I had started thinking about my dissertation. And so I'd been reading about enslaved persons and especially enslaved women. And when we went into all of these museums, we would see a funerary monument and there was always these small figures in the funerary monument. There would be the major sort of elite person and then there would be these small figures. And I would look and read the signs and they were never mentioned on the signs. And so I was going like, what are these? And when I mentioned it, then the answer that I got from the person at the museum or our tour guide was like, oh, those must be their children. And then I thought, "Mm, nope, I think these are slaves. (laughs) And so I sort of started taking pictures of them at every museum and started really noticing them. And then at some point I did a sort of deep dive into art history and classics who have in that field have written a lot about this archaeological evidence. And so I discovered that other people had already identified these as enslaved workers. But in the museums, they weren't acknowledged really at all. They were just there, but totally ignored. And I would say that that is very similar to antiquity, right? They were used in artwork really to elevate the status of the elite or the enslaver. That's what they were there for. So in the same way as we talked about with Aristotle and the ideological views of slavery, slaves viewed as tools or objects, that's how they're also used in art in this very similar way, which is depicted as sort of infantilizing and dehumanizing. They're really used on the funerary monument to speak to the viewer about the status of the enslaver. So symbolic sizing, or more recently it's been called hierarchic scaling, what that means is that the artist or sculptor is depicting someone who is more important, higher on the hierarchy, as larger. And then the lesser important persons are depicted as smaller. And so it doesn't mean that that enslaved person would be a child. I mean, it could be. There were many children who were enslaved in antiquity. But for every single funerary monument to have an enslaved child on it would be pretty unusual. So we can imagine that instead these are representing regular enslaved persons working, doing their jobs, but they're depicted as smaller because they're viewed as less important to the viewer. I'll talk especially about the women, though we see this happen with men on their funerary monuments as well. But one of the things that happens with the smaller enslaved figures is that they're either carrying an object. So they'll have a a jewelry box. The one behind you on the screen has a, a jewelry box or they'll have a mirror or they'll have a fan, or they'll have a container of oil. And these things all say something to the viewer about the enslaver. So the jewelry box would be a symbol of her beauty and her wealth that she had all this jewelry to choose from. The mirror would be a symbol of her beauty. And so these objects, the slaves are used to tell us more about the enslaver. And then if they're not holding an object, then their bodies are often put in a grieving posture. So for example, women are like this, or they'll be like this, um, and they're looking up at their enslaver. And that is a symbol of that even the enslaved workers are grieving the death of the enslaver who is deceased on the monument. And that shows that the enslaved the enslaver was kind and virtuous. That's what that is the, as you said, um, text through images, right? That you can read the text. So if we're reading that image of this enslaved person as grieving, then the viewer is supposed to think that enslaver was a really kind, generous enslaver. Right. And so that doesn't necessarily mean in historically that that's true, but that's the portrayal we are supposed to see on the funerary monument. Slaves on the artistic depictions are silenced in these museums just as much as they are in the text that we have from antiquity. If you read something like Apuleius's Golden Ass, the very first book, he's going along and then he just casually mentions he has a slave. These slaves just happen to like just pop up. The slaves are there during these discussions and they're not even acknowledged. And um, one of the great things about your book that I love that you took from these three instances uh, from the Luke Acts corpus um, is that 
you mentioned that these Haidiske have been silenced up until now. And I hope that today with our discussion, they will be heard for a little bit longer. So let's kind of get into the book and your research. So in your book, you focus on three passages from Luke Acts. You focus on Luke chapter 22, and Acts chapter 12, and chapter 16. And each of these has a female slave, Haidiske, because I know a lot of Christians and people who are into religious studies are uncomfortable with the idea that early Christianity and Jesus movements were proliferated by people who would own slaves and use slaves. So we're not going to sugarcoat this and try to say, oh, it was this huge abolitionist movement. It really wasn't. We're going to call them slaves. We need to understand that. Um, But we also need to understand how these things are subverting, as you say in your work, and we'll get more into that. In each of these passages from Luke and Acts, you have a Pidiske, a female slave who's featured and subverts the convention. She tells the truth despite their other status. So just talk about this a little bit. Tell us about your work. Yes, these three women are named Pataske. And the word there, I'll just, you know, go ahead and say is a word that could mean child and can also mean slave. And it specifically means a female slave who would work in a domestic or indoor context. So as you said, many people are uncomfortable with the idea of early Christians having slaves or recognizing that it's in our biblical text. And so in some ways, people have interpreted Pataske sometimes as child or in the case of Rhoda as a maid even. That's in the NRSV. But when you actually look at the context of the narrative, it becomes pretty clear that these women are enslaved. And using Pataske, it could mean that they are young. As I sort of talked about with the funerary monuments, it could mean that they were being depicted as a young woman, but it could also not be that they were physically or young in terms of age, but instead that this word is used in an infantilizing way. So it's a way of treating an enslaved person as less than through terminology. So in my work, I don't necessarily think these have to be younger, but each of them in the context of the narrative basically speak, right? They have a moment where they are, and that's unusual for an enslaved character and especially for an enslaved woman in the New Testament to, to speak and have this moment. And each of them, in turn, it's also that an apostle um, or a disciple is in the scene in the moment. So the first one, Luke, Luke 22, that Pateske is the first questioner in Luke of Peter in Peter's denial scene, which is a scene that's very familiar. And I think a lot of times people don't realize that this first questioner is an enslaved woman. And so she says, you know, do you know him? Meaning Jesus, are you one of them? And Peter says, no. And so who she knows the truth in that moment, right? She speaks. And Peter, on the other hand, is this high, you know, disciple that's been depicted throughout the gospel as one of, you know, one of Jesus's favorite disciples, really, or closest ones to him. And yet in this scene, the enslaved person knows the truth. Right. And she's the one proven correct. So the second one is Rhoda, who is the only one of these three that is given a name. And she's a Pataske who is in the house of Mary in Jerusalem. And it's also Peter that she interacts with. Peter miraculously escapes from prison and he's basically running from the law in this scene through the streets of Jerusalem. And he goes to a place where it would be safe for him to go, which is the house of Mary. And he goes there and he knocks on the door and the enslaved woman, Rhoda, it's her job to answer the door. And she at first is so overjoyed, the text says that she forgets and she doesn't answer the door and Peter's left outside still knocking. So there's some humor in this scene, but she goes back to the praying believers inside, including Mary, who is likely her enslaver since it's Mary's house and Rhoda's the one working there. And she says to them, this is Peter at the door. And they don't believe her. So they don't believe her. We can go back to what we were talking about earlier, where the word of enslaved persons was not trusted. And so they don't believe her. And she insists 
the Greek says. She insists that this is Peter. And they still don't believe her until they come to the door and then they see that it's Peter for themselves. And so again, she's proven correct, just as the very first Padaske was. And then the final one is Acts 16. And this is in Philippi. And this scene engages with Paul. So another, you know, major apostle in the Acts of Apostles. And Paul is going through Philippi with Silas and bringing his ministry, his the word of the gospel um, to the people of Philippi when an enslaved fortune teller, she has the spirit of the python in her and she starts following them and she also vocalizes a statement to these two men. And in my work, I argue that that statement is true in multiple ways. So her statement, she says, you are slaves of the most high God preaching the way of salvation. And Paul never says this is wrong. Paul's annoyed at her. And so then he exercises the spirit from her and that she loses her ability to work, really. She loses her gift. But in that moment, I think she's almost, almost the culmination of all three because she has this line that really is true in, in multiple ways. She is still silenced just as the other two are. I would say that the Paideske in Acts chapter 16, the slave with the gift of prophecy, is my favorite because like, I was. this kind of reminds me of Cassandra and Agamemnon by Aeschylus. But for those who don't, no, Cassandra is given the gift of prophecy by Apollo, but because she spurns his romantic advances, he makes it so. And that's why I thought it was relevant here. Nobody will believe you. Even if you say it, people will just think you're spouting nonsense. So what happens in Agamemnon, the play by Aeschylus? She's the only one literally telling the truth. She's like, Clytemnestra is going to murder this guy. Clytemnestra and her boyfriend are going to murder Agamemnon. They're just disregarding her because... She's not only a slave, she's also a woman and she's a barbarian, right? In that sense of the term back then. So yeah, the woman in Acts chapter 16 who has the gift of prophecy, it's really on the nose that in this text in Acts chapter 16, it's not that what she's doing is wrong. It's that Paul is just basically telling her to shut up and she right. loses that gift. You know, so it's it's a little bit on the nose if like you're looking at from a pastoral epistle hindsight. I'll keep going with that because it is, you're right. It's to me when I read it, it's very on the nose, as you say. But historically, commentators have read this as she has a demon within her. Like commentators have read this as a story of an exorcism, just like in the synoptic gospels or just like in Luke. And so they do not see her as telling the truth, they see her as sort of trying to take over Paul's ministry. They would also call her a pagan prophet, right? So they see her in this way. And then Paul's doing the right thing by silencing her. But like you, I don't read it as such. I read it as she's telling the truth about these two men in her own context, which might be the worship of Apollo, or maybe in the context of Zeus, but also within his own context for the Jewish God, right, that Paul is preaching. And so it can be true in both ways. But I also don't see this as a strict exorcism scene, because as you said, she didn't really do anything wrong. She's just, you know, he's annoyed by her <laughs> because of that she's followed him every day and she's yelling, ultimately. If you look at Acts, Acts especially within the context of the Mediterranean literary corpus of the, the romance, the novel, mm -hmm. these kind of characters and figures are everywhere in these texts. So you have Chaldean astrologers and fortune tellers everywhere in these stories. Exactly. Um, so it wouldn't be out of the ordinary, and especially the work of the late Richard Purvo, who has pointed out that Acts should be kind of considered like a novel in that sense. You have those motifs in there. We were just talking about Rhoda. Like you mentioned, Rhoda is a servant who's portrayed in a humorous way. That comes from, you know, plays, comedy, things like that. The running servant, like you said. So you have this humorous section in Acts chapter 14, where Paul and Barnabas are mistaken for Apollo and Zeus, I believe. Hermes. I Hermes. Yeah, I love that scene. <laughs> yeah, and what I love about Greek and Roman novels I've likened them to almost like silent movies and how everybody's so overly dramatic about things. And you see Paul and, and Barnabas tearing in their clothes and you know, everybody's like freaking out. 
It's almost like um, an Ephesian tale, the scene where Habrokomes and Anthea are kidnapped by the pirates and yeah. Habrokomes' tutor jumps into the ocean and he just starts swimming. And he's probably an enslaved person too, right? He's swimming That's after. Right. He's mm-hmm. like, oh no. You know, the, the author just says, oh, then he died. He drowned. <laughs> so coming back to Acts and reading your book really brought home that, yeah, a lot of these motifs are here. We need to recognize that. And this is what I really loved about your book and the various intersections and parallels that you make with Greco-Roman novels and other ancient Mediterranean literature. They are, I always say, a great source for ancient understandings of explorations of identity, role Mm -hmm. reversal, especially for that elite audience. You can see what it's like to be a a bucoloi or a slave, but you don't have to stay there because everything's going to kind of go from topsy-turvy back to normal, so to speak, at the end. I definitely agree with you that I think Acts should be read as one of these novels. I mean, it just seems so obvious to me when you read the Greco-Roman novels alongside Acts that there are so many tropes, as you've mentioned already, especially the gods and goddesses that sort of show up because you mentioned the scene with Hermes and Zeus, but then we also have that big scene with Artemis, which is one of my favorite chapters in Acts. And then of course we have this prophet who I think is likely in line with the Delphi oracles. So we have a number of these spaces, but then also at the end of Acts, when Paul is being taken to Rome, we have this shipwreck scene and that is exactly like so many scenes in the ancient novels. When you read it, you're like, oh, this is exactly like what I've read about, even going back to the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? We have these very similar literary tropes that pop up in Acts, and it certainly should affect our reading. And I think that's one of the big reasons why I'm able to use Bakhtin, because Bakhtin, he says very little about the New Testament in his work. And I'll back up and say Bakhtin, for any listeners who aren't familiar, is a literary theorist and philosopher, Russian, and he does quite a bit of work on sort of literary readings and novels, and he pulls in the Greco-Roman novels in some of his work. So my reading of Acts as a novel allows me to really use Bakhtinian literary theory as applied to Acts in a, and I think a really fruitful way, at least for me. (laughs) And so that novelistic aspects of Acts is very important to my work because it's the way that I approach it too. Especially the instances you talk about with Leucope and Leucope and Clytophon, where Leucope is literally shorn of her hair and she's got the status of a slave. Tying back into Luke chapter 22 with the female slave who's looking at Peter, glancing at him, seeing him. It's the kind of concept of like, you can see somebody understand who they are through the gaze, that kind of physiognomical idea they had back then. Leucope is unrecognizable to everybody. Whereas in something like Cariton, with Clear Away, right? When Clear Away, they're trying to pass her off as a slave, but nobody's buying that. <laughs> Very interesting uh, idea there. It is. And those novels give us more information about slavery and the way enslaved persons were perceived, especially when it comes to women, the both of these scenes, because of all the sort of the literary tropes that are used to depict these persons are ones to depict enslaved persons. But also these free women escape slavery, right? Like they're not ever really enslaved. And that's that sort of Aristotle natural slavery at work there, right? That they were, yeah. Lucape was, is never really enslaved. She's just in a very bad situation that will ultimately be resolved because she is free, right? But it's really helpful because As I said, those three scenes are the only three scenes where we have these female enslaved characters in Luke Acts that have this moment of speaking, you know? And so they're short, but in the novels, there's so much more information. And so in another way that I use Bakhtin and then also a little Kristeva is by reading these alongside each other. And so I can say, okay, the novels can tell us something about Acts and can tell us something about the apocryphal Acts as well as we use what we find inside of the novels to in- read and interpret Acts. And yes, let's get into the apocryphal Acts because the text that you focus on in particular and the story you focus on in particular is in the Acts of Andrew. I don't know if you want to talk about this 
very horrific scene in my opinion but yeah just kind of go into it euclia her inability to consent to any of this and being punished for it so the euclia story is one that has if you ever in scholarship have something it just won't let you go that's the way i feel about euclia <laughs> so i've published on her a number of different times and i keep turning back to her because it's so troubling to me this scene for Viewers who are unfamiliar, this is in the text, The Apocryphal Acts of Andrew. And in this text, we have an elite woman named Maximilla, who is also an enslaver of multiple enslaved women. And she is a devoted Christian. She's converted and she really falls in line with everything that Andrew is teaching, including that she decides she's not going to have sex with her husband anymore. Her husband, Agiates is a very important person in her local town and is perceived as the sort of antagonist in the narrative because, you know, he doesn't approve of Maximilla's new faith or this new movement. And so Maximilla decides she doesn't want to have sex with him anymore, but he, she knows he'll be mad and he will insist on having sex with her. And so she tells Euclia, her enslaved worker inside the house, to basically go in every night and pretend to be her and sleep with her husband instead. And she does this really by sort of bribing Euclia or tantalizing Euclia with freedom. So she says, if you do this for me, you know, I might give you freedom. So Euclia does it. And this is a the natural slavery piece because this is a moment where the divisions between who is free and who is enslaved sort of fall apart because it works. Agiates doesn't recognize, you know, that he's having sex with Euclia instead of Maximilla, which means that they must look a lot alike. She's wearing Maximilla's clothes and she's coming in and she's sort of passing as Maximilla in that moment. Well, it works for almost nine months until this deception is uncovered. And Agiates gets very, very mad. And this is when he first tortures some enslaved male workers in the house to get them to tell him the truth as to what's happening. And then he tortures Euclia. This is a really horrible scene where he cuts out her tongue. And I believe the Greek is hinting at basically genital mutilation as well. So she's brutally tortured after, let's acknowledge, being raped consistently by a guillotine in the house, right? On a maybe nightly basis, you know, for this number of months. You mentioned that she's being bribed by her, mm -hmm. her mistress, but Euclia can't consent. She's no. a body. There's this whole elephant in the room of he's being sent to be raped. So this elite woman who can basically hang out with her new kind of spiritual boyfriends, <laughs> can hang out with these guys, and yeah. she's sending her slave to be raped every night. That's what's happening. So. That's exactly what's happening. And this is a point that I make in the chapter that's in the book that you mentioned in my introduction, Sex, Violence, and Early Christianity. And my chapter in that book is called Euclid's Story because I'm basically trying to retell and center Euclia in this story. And you're exactly right. She is unable to give consent because she has no choice. If she says no to her enslaver, she's going to be tortured and killed anyways, or sold and put in a worse situation such as a brothel. She was in no position to have refused to do this. But Maximilla coordinates this, in my view. She coordinates the rape of Euclia. Agiates is blissfully unaware for most of the text. Now, at the end, he is the one responsible for the torture and ultimate murder of Euclia because he puts her outside the house to die. I mean, it, again, a very brutal, inhumane death. And so he is responsible for that piece. But I think Maximilla, this free elite woman who was really elevated as a model Christian, especially in later texts and, and in interpretations. She's the one who sets all this up to protect her own body. So she's trying to keep herself pure because she believes it's what she needs to do for her new religion, her new faith. But in the context, she uses this enslaved person's body to get that. I love the point that you bring up in your book, drawing on other scholarship as well, but mm -hmm. the point you make is that these ascetic kind of 
aspects of conversions to Christianity by the elites are almost like um, an assertion of their bodily autonomy versus somebody like a slave who can't consent to being sent to their uh, master's bedroom or um, <clears throat> even as far back as something like the Odyssey, right? Or right. the Iliad. The first book of the Iliad is two warlords arguing over who gets to who get gets who sex slaves or who gives who sex sex slave back. In the Odyssey, we read these texts of the suitors at Penelope's house are taking the women to bed at night, but those women can't consent. Those are Odysseus's slaves. It's the same thing. They're committing mm -hmm. hubris against Odysseus, you know, intentional dishonor. So it's the same thing here. We have to understand that these are. Um, non-consenting people. And it actually reminded me of um, getting back to the um, Acts chapter 16 for a second with yeah. the juxtaposition of Lydia with yeah. the prophesying slave. These elite women can assert their autonomy by not having sex with their husbands, things like that, which, you know, getting back to the Greek novels, there's always the suitor. It's usually the master who wants the heroine, but she's being chased, the sophrosine for their husband. It's in the apocryphal acts literature. It's almost like the lover that they've been separated from is now taken by the, the apostle in the story <laughs> in a spiritual sense. I feel this is an important distinction to make because like we said at the beginning of this program, people are uncomfortable with the idea that there are slaves in these early Jesus movements. There are forced conversions. If your household is being baptized, do the slaves have consent to be baptized? So Right. It's such an important thing to note. And because we, we do see this in Acts, as you've noted, with Lydia, with the jailer, with maybe Cornelius, that there are enslaved workers around. And when they're converted, the enslaved workers are assumed to join the movement as well. But is that, you know, an authentic version of a conversion or authentic baptism when these people are baptized along with their enslavers. And I think with Euclia and Maximilla, that's a very similar idea. So Maximilla has another female enslaved worker in the house, Ephedema, who is the model enslaved person and is sort of going along with her. And you can kind of see this. And then Euclia is the one that is perceived by the literature as sort of resisting or as the bad slave stereotype trope. But I think we have to resist that reading, right? And in order to see a bit more resistance in action instead and see these as perhaps subverting. But as you said, I think what's really troubling for people is to think about the early Jesus movement as being quite so invested in slavery. Because we see this as like, think of Galatians 3.28, right? Where Paul says, there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. We have that verse and we have other instances of Christianity's push to be egalitarian, right? And then we still have slavery ever present there. And that is really troubling to people. And I, I think rightfully so, but I think acknowledging it is what we need to do and pointing it out in the text. And then that way we can sort of say, okay, this is in our text. This is in the history, but that doesn't have to make it right or <laughs> ethical, even though it's there. So the first step there is at least acknowledging that it's there. It's a part of the history of Christianity. And then once you're able to do that, then you can sort of move forward, right? But there are so many people who resist seeing the presence of enslaved persons in Christianity. For instance, people will say, well, for an enslaved person, it wasn't that bad back then. I hear that a lot. And yeah, I mean, as you, you sort of mentioned this early on with the everyday life of the slave, and that's why I started with the brutality picture, because I think sometimes people imagine this like, oh, well, it's an enslaved person, but they had a really good life. <laughs> and like, they're still enslaved. <laughs> I think that that's worth pointing out. You can even take that even further into the novels in general. I always think of something like Satirica with... Trimalchio's feast. Trimalchio is talking about how he was his master's favorite slave as a boy. Yeah. We just hear that. We go, okay, well, the slave must have just been really liked by his master. Yeah, no, that's not what that means. That means that he was sexually available to his master. You mentioned in the book and other scholars have mentioned this, there's a sexual stigma attached to being a freed person. And that especially comes, I mean, it, as you said, it it can 
cross gender in the sense of that male slaves were also susceptible to sexual violence, right? And then female slaves were as well. And I think you're right to point that out because we don't recognize that as much, but it is a part of the daily life of an enslaved person that this could happen to you and that you have no real ability to stop sexual violence from happening. It was a very regular part of their lives. But especially for female slaves, because they were used as sort of breeders for more enslaved persons. So that's an especially troubling part of the life of a female slave. Like you said, it's very important to acknowledge this is part of the past. So we can say that that's not okay. And that's not where we are now. And we can transform things, so to speak. And since we're talking about apocryphal acts, I was reading a very wild apocryphal act called the Acts of Christ and Peter in Rome. It's a wild story where Peter is like 130 years old, living in a cave. And then Jesus comes disguised as a sailor, takes him to Rome, and he sells himself as a slave boy to Peter. So it's basically a combination of the apocryphal acts literature and like the infancy narratives. The slave boy does all kinds of miracles and in Rome with Peter. I thought it was very weird because like Jesus is the slave boy. And I was just reading about the favorite slave boys of, you know, at Trevelkio. So yeah. in very strange contours. It's similar to the Acts of Thomas, where Thomas, Judas Thomas is viewed in the Acts as Jesus's twin. And so it's a sort of playful back and forth. Are you hearing from Jesus or are you hearing from Thomas? Because they're twins and they look alike. But at the very beginning, Thomas doesn't want to go to India. He's the apostle called to go to India to share the message. And so he is is sold into slavery. He's like, you know, purchased by an enslaver and he's taken to India forcefully as a slave. And it seems like God is sort of making that happen within the text. So yeah, very similar kind of idea of Jesus as enslaved, but also Jesus as sort of affirming this sort of human trafficking situation. It was very bizarre. Jesus sells himself to Peter as the slave. The slave gets to Rome and he's doing all these miracles. Like I said, it's basically like a, a riff on the infancy gospel of Thomas. He even goes to school at one section. Like he's given to this really skeezy guy mm -hmm. to go to his household for a while. I don't understand where they found all this time. <laughs> and you just mentioned something, this rhetoric of slavery that Paul uses, that early Christianity uses. And Paul himself was arguably an elite as well. So mm -hmm. my question would be, do you think Paul was using slaves to help write his epistles? I do. Yes. I, in fact, he's pretty clear about this in his own letters because he says, like, I'm dictating this, right? If you read the letters closely, he's acknowledging that he's using enslaved workers as scribes and also as messengers to deliver his letters. There's a really interesting article out by Ulrika Roth who makes this argument that Paul, as one of our first people to be traveling around the Mediterranean world, sharing Christianity, the way that he used enslaved workers means that Christianity relied upon enslaved workers to become what it is. Like there wouldn't be a Christianity without slaves because who wrote the letters, who would deliver all the letters, who would be sending messages back and forth right? These are all enslaved jobs. And then when a person arrives at a town, who's going to take care of them? The enslaved persons in the house where Paul is staying, right? And so there's this idea in which all of Christianity is sort of built on slave labor from the very beginning as it traveled out into the broader Mediterranean world. Just talking about Paul, I was reading Sarah Rudin's book, Paul Amongst the People. She just kind of tries to put him in the context of the philosophy, the literature of his time. And she was talking about the Onesimus episode and how a lot of people in, in the 18th, 19th century wanted to argue from an abolitionist standpoint for this letter. But really, what's going to happen to Onesimus once he's freed by this master? He's just going to be put into a patronage situation where he still has to kiss this guy's butt to, you know, exist. So if Onesimus was even manumitted, then he would have certainly still had to retain his relationship with Philemon in a number of ways, as you said, as a sort of patron or 
in the manumission contract, these kind of things were written in where he would still have to say, do some work for Philemon or be responsible with him. And he would still sort of have that lingering. It's not as if freed in, in when an enslaved person was freed, they were just often free. They still had this sort of label of freed person that was on them. And then they often had contractual responsibilities to the person that they were previously enslaved to. But then we don't even know if Onesimus was freed. So I do think it's valuable to point out that this text was used, as you said, in the abolition movement. And I think that's really important and valid. When we think of it in the context of ancient slavery too, though, we don't know for sure if he was freed, right? And so there's been a number of different sort of solutions put out that Paul could be perhaps another enslaver of Onesimus. And then he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon and saying, he's now a brother, meaning he's a Christ follower like Paul and like Philemon, but not that he should be freed. And so it's really uncertain, right? Onesimus's future is undetermined. Christy, thank you so much for coming on, talking about these very important very difficult topics with us. Oh, thank you. 